Good morning and welcome to Bethel Presbyterian Church. We are so very thankful that you could come celebrate with us on this, the second Sunday of Lent. Uh, a few quick notes. Next Sunday, our guest pastor will be the Reverend Kay Florence, uh, and we will be taking the Lord's Supper together, so please make sure that you have your elements available. Uh, I do want to tell you about an important thing that's coming up. We should all be receiving a letter from Bethel here in the mail. And this letter is going to be a questionnaire that's going to ask about how you want this church to be, essentially. And I want you to, to really take this to heart and to consider it and not throw it out, as a lot of us do when we receive mail like this. And the reason is because, for one, quite obviously, we don't have a pastor. Uh, and for two, obviously, the church is changing. Uh, it was mentioned to me this morning about how COVID has affected one person's life and made their whole routine different. And it's, it's affected everything we do. And so we need to bear in mind that this is not my church. It's not... Miss Sherry's church. It's not Mr. Bill's church. It's not Nancy's church. It's our church and it's God's church. And to determine the direction that we want this church to go needs to be something that we take very seriously. We need to take time to pray. We need to take time to consider what God has in store for us. And then we have to answer openly and honestly. So, once you receive that paperwork in the mail, look it over. You don't have to necessarily write out your answers because one of the elders from the church will be contacting you to discuss it with you. Please do take that call and bear in mind that the direction that we take is as much your, cho uh, as much your choice rather as it is mine. That being said, let us take time to prepare ourselves for worship. Feels good, doesn't it? To be in the presence of God, to feel his spirit fill this place. Let us have now our call to worship, which comes to us from Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to God. God's face is not hidden from us when we cry to God. The poor shall eat and be satisfied for dominion belongs to the Lord, and God rules over all the nations. Let us pray. Dear Lord, with open arms you welcome all who call on your name, all who acknowledge you as Lord and look to you in faith. No one stands outside the circle of your mercy and love. And so we come to offer you our worship to declare that you are God and that we are your people, called and chosen by you from the very beginning. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see you here. Open our minds to receive your truth and our mouths to speak and sing your praise. For you alone are God, worthy of all praise and worship, now until the very end of time itself, 
Amen. Our first hymn today, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Our call of confession today, if we would only confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from the wrongs we have caused. Let us confess our sins together, trusting God's promised mercy. Let us take time to personally confess our sins unto our Father. Join me now in this, our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and one another in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. There is a brokenness in us that reflects the brokenness of our world, and it is deep and broad. Yet in your mercy and healing grace, you can restore us and empower us to walk in the way of Christ. In your mercy and healing grace, you can reform our past, Lord, towards love and justice for our neighbors and for the earth. If your mercy and healing grace, you can make your peace, your shalom, a reality in our community and in our lives. Amen. And folks, here is the best part of the day. I give you an assurance pardon. God's mercy and healing grace are sure for each and every one of us. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, 
we are both forgiven and restored. We are set on the right paths of love, justice, and peace, friends. We are truly forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads and share this prayer of illumination. O oh God, Send your spirit to us to open our hearts that we might discern your word amid the words of scripture we read today. So that in hearing your word, we may be formed in the way of Christ for one another in our world. Amen. Friends, today's Old Testament scripture comes to us from Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 through 7. Listen now. For the word of the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of all multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after your forethought through generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Our psalm comes from Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Our next hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
Our gospel scripture today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. By turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my world or words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This, too, is the word of God. Thanks be to God. My sermon today has kind of a, a funny title, if you will. But it's something that I hope that we take very seriously. Don't forget to laugh, though, too, because, you know, a little bit of humor makes everything a little easier to take. I have a big confession to make to you about me. Some of you may already know this about me, but I am a huge science fiction geek. Love it. Absolutely adore it. From, from the earliest on that I can remember, as far back, and some of you are going to say, yeah, that's not that far back. For me, it's very far back. But Buck Rogers, Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, Aliens, Predator, Firefly, The Expanse, all of these shows, I, I just absolutely adore them. I look forward to them. It's one of those things that really gives me true joy. Uh, I have a crazy collection of uh, the little Funko Pop figurines, and they're all over my room. I believe I have, uh, y'all are going to really laugh, but I think I have 82 of them. That's a lot. It takes up a lot of space. I just love science fiction, and I love that type of thing. Um, I still do, in fact, and that's why I landed on my title for today's sermon, which I've called Resistance is Futile. Uh, this was a famous quote from Star Trek, The Next Generation. Um, personally, I was a Captain Kirk fan, but this is the Picard era for those of you in the know. Uh, in that series, they come across an enemy of biomechanical cyborgs that threaten to take over all of humanity, and they're going to take them all together and mash them up and mold them into one system. Uh, and they say that res the resistance to them is a waste of time, it can't be any good, that the good guys in the series, namely Captain Picard and his band on the Enterprise, should just give up. Nothing they can do will help them win the day or avoid being assimilated into the Borg Collective. Uh, 
sounds kind of familiar in a way. Um, it's amazing how science fiction has a way of touching on something that at the time seemed so far and away and outlandish or even impossible. And then now we look back on some of the things that Star Wars and Star Trek talked about. They're everyday items that we use all the time. I remember being a grand uh, kid to my grandfather, actually. I know how silly that sounds, but my mother's dad running around in his yard with a walkie-talkie, thinking that I was the absolute coolest thing in the world because we were playing Star Trek, and I was Captain Kirk, and I had my little beep, beep, beep communicator that I could talk back and forth to my grandpa on. We have cell phones now. We don't even have to hit buttons. We can just say, hey, call Nancy Johnson before I know what I'm connected to her. I don't even have to take the phone out of my pocket. Anyway, back to, to the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, the collective and being assimilated in, it, it all seems like an inevitable fate uh, that we see sometimes even in scripture today. Words like destiny, fate, predetermination. These words we actually tend to fight against, namely because we don't like them. You see, every man, woman, and child today wants to believe that at some level that the choices they make are theirs, that the decisions we make now will be what affect us and what we're judged for the rest of our lives. On the flip side of the same coin, no one ever wants to think that that future has already been determined, that all of our decisions have already been made, and that our fate is locked into place. Hollywood has put millions, if not billions of dollars into movies about time travel and future and changing the past and our fate is not what we what it is made into, but what we make it to be and all these things. Because on some level, we all want to believe that the only one that we're actually responsible for is ourselves and the choices that we make about us. Let's ponder that just a moment, if you will. And think about some of those moments in life that in an instant affect you. And I hate to tell you this, but it affects the people around you for the rest of life, for the rest of time. Decisions like coming out of high school, what do you do? Do you join the military? That's what I did. It turned out to be a very good choice for me. Some of you think about possibly going to college. Maybe you should go to a trade school. Maybe that decision never was yours. Maybe it was already made. Which brings me to another common question that, that our lineage faces today, if you will. What if you're involved in a teenage pregnancy? Now, yes, I can come back and say, guys, don't get pregnant. Well, guys are as absolutely as much responsible for that decision as the female involved. So it is two. God does say that when you take that act on, that one and two become twine. Two bodies, one decision. A decision that not only affects the boy and the girl, but the baby to be born. And that set of parents and that set of parents and that family and that family and all the other people that are involved. Big, big moment that is so often flippantly taken on. What about marriage? Does marriage affect in that way? 
I can guarantee you that it affects futures. Sometimes something so very simple as making a left turn instead of a right on a road can actually alter the course of life. But some of you will say, but does it really? I mean, we are Presbyterians, after all. And as Presbyterians, we believe in certain concepts, one of those concepts being predestination. Predestination is a major theological piece that sets us apart from all other denominations. It is the belief that God is a being that is in all three tenses, if you would. God is all past, present, and future, all at the same time. And that means he already knows what you're going to do before you even do it, before you even think it. He has already chosen. Those are his elect versus those that will, and I do say this very poignantly, versus those that will burn for eternity in flame. The elect are those persons, hopefully that's all of us, and I do believe that that is all of us that, that I know and have spent time with and have talked to, but it's all of us that have already made that decision, which God knows. And he has chosen us because we have already confessed with our mouths, but more importantly, with our hearts, that Jesus is Lord and that we believe with all of our heart that God will raise him from the dead so that we will be saved. Romans 10, 9. I have that on my arm. I know a lot of you don't believe in tattoos. Um, we're not going to get into that today, but let me say that that is something that I so strongly identified with that I felt like I had to have it permanently put into my flesh, which is something that they mention a lot in Genesis that we read earlier in that chapter about making a permanent show of your covenant in the flesh, a choice. It's hard pill to swallow, in a way, if you think about it, that our choices are already known, they've already been done, they've already had their reaction, their decision has already taken its effect. Does that mean that my decisions really don't matter? Does that mean that I can go on repeatedly sinning again and again and again and not worry about the condition of my soul? <laughs> Hang on a second while, Bill. That's not the way that this goes, okay? And that's the trick. That's the, the, the turn, if you will, about free will. Just because God already knows what we've decided, we don't. We still make that decision. He didn't make us or make that decision for us. And that's the hardest part of the concept to understand. We do have free will. We do have the ability to make that decision. God just already knows which way we're going to go. He sees it because he knows the future, even though it's our presence. So I guess, truly, if you think about it, there is no hiding from the eyes of the Lord, one. And two, the real and true question is, are you really, truly one of his elect? Now, I've told you that I believe you are chosen, that, that I will someday be with you all in heaven. But the question right now is, what do you think? How do you think and feel about the selections and the choices that you made? Just because you're sitting here now in the house of the Lord, in his presence, or even sitting at home, watching this on your TV or your phone, what have you, you're still coming to God to worship him. But do you really, really believe that you are in fact saved. 
Do you really keep Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in your heart where He belongs? Because that will affect those very decisions that you make. This is the question we should all be asking ourselves from time to time. Most of us here today, we have the Holy Spirit within us. That Holy Spirit acts like our conscience. It talks to us. It tells us things that we should and shouldn't do. Do we listen? And can we tell the difference between the little voice, the little good voice, and the little bad voice that always seems to be right there with us at all times? Speaking to us, whispering to us, telling us what we can and can't do versus what we should and shouldn't do. In our first scripture today, we heard about Abram and his covenant with God. Abram wasn't able to believe what God was telling him at first. Like I said, that little voice, the devil perhaps, was speaking to Abram at the exact same time that God was. And he was telling him all about the impossibilities of what God was promising. God does not always choose the easiest course of action for us. We do not ever, it seems like, at least in my case, choose the easiest course of action. And the devil will use this to confuse you. The Lord had told Abram that he was changing his name to Abraham and that he would be fruitful and multiply. Can you imagine that? Hey, Deborah, from now on, we're going to call you Josephine. And as old as you are, which is very young, I realize, but even at your age, you're going to give birth again. Now, that just sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? But if you are a true Christian, do you believe anything is possible through God? I want to share with you that uh, here in the next three days, I will turn 48 years old. Now, 48 to me seems for me. I don't want to offend anybody. But for me, 48 seems old. Uh, for one, I've gotten really used to having Arthur around me all the time. You know Arthur? Most of us know him by his full name, Arthritis. Um, every bone that you've broke over the years or tendon that you've strained, all these things, they start to feel pain as you get older. It's inevitable. It happens. I have some of the other big hits uh, that you start to get as you age, like nerve damage, um, degenerative bone disease. The biggest one that I fight all the time is that I get much easier, or I'm sorry, much easier. I get much more tired easier than I used to. My mom likes to tell me that I don't even realize the half of it yet. It's just going to get worse. What a wonderful thought that I've already seen the best of life. It's just going to go downhill from here. But that's one of the hardest things about it and why we can talk about resistance. Because resistance is part of our human nature and resistance to time, although it's the one thing we want to do, is most definitely futile. That's why I agree with Abraham that he just could not imagine what it would be like to have a child at his age. I'm 48. If I were to, by the grace of God, find a woman that I loved, we were to have a child together. By the time they got to high school, I would already be retired. Well, I'll never get to retire. I would should have been retired. I'll be old enough to where I could have had 
a son or daughter that's my age now. It's hard to think about, isn't it? Yet, even Abram, who was 99 years old, forgot to realize that God can do anything. There's nothing too hard for God. And that he'd already seen it. He's already seen the future. He already knows that all of this will come to pass. He knows that Abram will have a son. He knows that that son will be called Isaac. And he knows that from Isaac will come that point in the Bible that says, Abram begot Isaac, begot, 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 begot. And it goes on until we get to a point where we talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is still 2,000 years ago. But he gets to that point. And it's the point that we talked about in our scripture uh, from the gospel today. It led to Jesus and eventually to Peter. Peter, who is one of the more favorite apostles, and who is considered the rock. His very name means the rock. That's another name that God chose to change. He named him Peter because he would be the rock of his ministry, the foundation of his church. And yet think of Peter and some of the things that he did and some of the decisions that he made. He resisted Jesus quite often, even though he felt the pull immediately. It said, you must Come with me, follow me. And he knew he must. Peter would try many times, in fact, to think his way through what was going on instead of just go with it. He was the first one to answer when Jesus asked. He told Jesus that you are the Christ, the Messiah. Yet he did not fully believe that things would go along with that realization. Remember Peter when he was in the boat. He was very quick to believe that, yes, that is Jesus walking on water towards me. And he was very quick to say, call out to me, ask me to come to you. And he got out of the boat and he walked on water for a step or two before he let his humanity rush back. And then he sank. Peter continued to resist or not comprehend what Jesus had to do. And he tried to tell Jesus that he could not be allowed to be captured and taken and killed. We can't do without you, Jesus. And Jesus had to rebuke him and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Famous words. I'm running long. I apologize. So I'll try to wrap it up here. I, I'm getting involved and I'm going way off script, but... The point that I'm trying to make here is that we all feel the pull of our human nature. We all want to go against the word of God at some time or another. Sin is good. Sin is fun. Sin is easy. These are the things that we're getting told constantly, not just by the enemy, but by the news media and by our government and by those that are around us that influence us. But we have to resist that. And we have to keep in mind that by resisting that, we are not resisting the big picture. We cannot resist the call of God. That's why we're here. We have all felt that quickening in our hearts. We all want to do the right thing. We all feel guilty when we do wrong. We all want the Holy Ghost to guide us. To do anything other than to be a good Christian and to follow the word of God is, simply put, futile. Speaking of this, let us talk about what it is that we believe. Will you please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed? Christians, please. Tell me what it is that you believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, at this time, I would like to ask for your tithes and offerings. God is a fountain of good gifts that are bestowed upon us all. Let us respond to these gifts by returning a portion of that resource as a sign that all of who we are is a gift from God. You can leave your tithe or offering in the narthex. You can contact an elder. You can mail it to us at 1593 Warpath Drive, Kingsport, Tennessee, 37664. Or you can contact, I already said, you can contact one of your elders, and we'll be happy to take care of that. Friends, let us just give thanks really quickly. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, please accept these gifts that we have offered to you. We give them freely, and we give them with love. We give them in hopes that they will help grow this church, your church universal, the mission, and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we do these things in his name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Will you pray with me? O oh God, receive these gifts as a sign that our lives are committed to your work in this world. May these gifts enable flourishing for all your children and the whole creation. Amen. Now we will watch a video, I Stand Amazed.
shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me Join me now for our prayer of the people in the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, our Creator and Redeemer, we pray that the Spirit of Jesus would be with us as we continue our journey through Lent. Jesus called his disciples to pick up their cross and follow him. Help us to discern what that means for us as the church in this time and place. Give us the courage to name suffering and evil and to stand in resistance to it. Give us endurance when we face persecution from resisting abuses in our lives and communities. Empower us to stand with those who suffer on account of homelessness, lack of food or resources, or other in, excuse me, injustices. Inspire us to see Christ in the least of these in our midst. Oh God, we pray for those who are isolated and lonely during this pandemic. May we find ways to be a comfort to them. We pray for the children and the parents who are navigating school and work under such stressful circumstances. We pray for those who have lost loved ones because of the virus and are grieving the loss. We pray for your church in this time of crisis and that we would find new ways to live your mission. We also pray for those hurt by the snow and the ice and the storms and all the things that have ravaged large sections of our country add into the already stressful realities of life on our, uh, in our current crisis. And, oh God, we continue to pray for the global community as it grapples with the pandemic. We pray that your, uh, your word would give us the fortitude to take responsibility for measures that will protect us all. We pray especially for those hit hardest by the strains of this menace and pray for those in leadership in our communities, our states, and most assuredly, our nation, as they negotiate ways in which to aid those most afflicted. We pray for a speedy process of the vaccination in this country and in all countries. And we pray for fairness and access to said vaccine for not just this country, but again, all countries. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go out into God's world in the power of his spirit. Resist evil and stand for good. Be a blessing to your neighbor and lift up the brokenhearted. Stand with the oppressed. And let all that you do be done out of love. And please remember to resist the call of God is futile. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's most blessed name. Amen.